So your first challenge here is to figure out what this picture is. I would invite you to pause this presentation for a while and then see if you can figure out what this is a picture of. I guarantee you it's a very clear picture once you've seen it and it's an object that you have for certain seen before. So go ahead and pause this for a minute while you try and figure it out and then I'll show you what it is. All right, have you figured it out yet? Well, this picture here is actually a cow. If you look, you'll see this is the cow's face here. He has one eye here and one eye here. He has an ear here. He has another ear over here that actually kind of goes off of the screen. And this is his back down here, and he's actually sort of turning his head and looking towards us. Now, what I want you to get from this experience is that human vision is about a lot more than just the light rays that are coming into our eyes. You had the same light rays coming into your eyes before and after I showed you the cow here. But watch what happens if I take the sketch of the cow away now. You can clearly see that this is a picture of a cow, and that's something that your brain couldn't make sense of before. So while we are going to focus a lot on what happens to light rays when they come into your eyes, don't forget that the human brain plays the most important role of all in processing those light rays and helping us to make meaning of what we see. First, it's helpful to understand how it is that we're looking at the eye. We think of the eyeball as a fairly round thing, and we're going to look at it using two major views. The first view is what we call a cutaway view. So in a cutaway view, it's as though we've taken a portion of the eye and we've sliced into it to see what the inside looks like. We will actually be dissecting an eye, but your cuts won't be quite so neat. More often though, what we're going to do is we're going to take what's called a cross-sectional view of the eye. In a cross-sectional view, it's as though we took the eye and split it right down the middle and that we only look at what we would see along the edge of where we made that cut. So for example, this here would be the front part of the eye. This would be the part of the eye that you see as being the colored portion of your eye. This up here would be the white of your eye. This down here would be the white of your eye that's below the colored portion, etc. So we're often going to be using these cross sections of the eye, and I just wanted you to understand the views that we were looking at. Okay, so let's take a quick overview of how light enters the human eye. So light rays from the outside world come in. You can see I've shown here that we have some light rays coming in from the outside world. Those light rays enter the eye through an opening known as the pupil. In this cross-sectional view, the pupil is represented by this gap here. You'll see that there is some dark lines here. This is actually going to be your iris, and here as well. But this is an opening. The pupil is actually an opening in your eye. It is a hole that light goes through. The iris, which is the colored portion of your eye, is going to determine how much light actually gets into your eye. So in this example, the iris would be here and here. Now again, in a cross-sectional view, it looks like it's two little separate pieces. But in your eye, this is the circle that's colored. So if you have brown eyes, this is brown. If you have blue eyes, this is blue. The reason it looks like two separate pieces is that in this cross-sectional view, we've cut through the top of it and the bottom of it. And the iris can actually change its size. It can become like this, which lets less light through in the pupil, or it can open back up to let more light in. Light rays then get focused on the retina. The retina is in the back of the eye here. It's like the projector screen that those light rays get focused on. And this is where the image is ultimately transferred down the optic nerve and to your brain. The retina has in it rod cells and cone cells. These are two different kinds of cells that are designed to do two different things in your eyes. 
the rod cells are designed to detect light and dark. So if you had only rod cells, it would be as though you could see the world in black and white. You would be able to tell what areas were dark and what were light. The cone cells actually sense color. And both of those cells send signals down the optic nerve. So the rod and the cone cells are located here in the retina that's in the back of your eye. They connect to the optic nerve, which exits through the back of the eye and carries all of the information about how light and dark and how colorful things are back to the brain. The brain then makes sense of all of those signals. The brain is what turns the light and dark messages into, oh, I see a cow. This is a really interesting picture that's actually drawn by the father of a former student. So a neat job, if you're interested in both science and art, is a job of a medical illustrator. This is a person who draws pictures of things to help doctors and patients and medical students better understand how the parts of the human body are put together. So this is sort of a cross-section, but it's got a little bit of 3D-ishness to it. So you can see here, this is your iris. This person appears to have a brown iris. The opening in the center of the iris is the pupil. This thing in here that looks kind of like a clear M&M, this is the lens. This is a flexible lens that changes where light falls on the retina. And these little things that look sort of like hairs on the end are called suspensory ligaments. The suspensory ligaments pull on the lens to make it flatter or relax to let the lens become thicker. Remember the light box activity you did where you had a thick concave lens, sorry, a thick convex lens and a thin convex lens? Well, the suspensory ligaments can change how thick or thin the lens in your eye is, and that lets you focus on things that are close by or things that are far away. Now, this segment up here is the cornea. If you wear contact lenses, the contact lenses rest directly on top of the cornea. The cornea is clear, which allows light to go through it. And behind the cornea, there is a fluid. That fluid is called the aqueous humor. And that fluid keeps the cornea inflated. It also helps provide nourishment to the cornea, since as you can see, there aren't blood vessels flowing through this cornea. Someone asked once, what does a retina look like? Well, this is a picture of a real honest-to-goodness good, retina. This, in fact, is your teacher's retina. So you'll see a couple of different things here. This dark area is called the fovea. This is the area that has the greatest density of rods and cone cells. And this is where the image is most clear. So generally, the lens is going to be focusing the image in this area, this fovea. Off to the side of that, you can see the area where the optic nerve exits the rear of the eye. Right where the optic nerve exits that spot there, there are actually no rods and cone cells, that little bright spot there. And you have what's called a blind spot there. There is actually a point in your field of vision where you don't see. Now the blind spot is in different places in your two eyes, and so you don't notice it in normal everyday life. The outer coat of the mammalian eye is called the sclera. It's a tough, opaque layer of tissue that protects the inner structures and helps to maintain rigidity of the eye. At the front of the eye, this becomes the thinner, transparent cornea through which light enters the eye and is bent towards the lens. Just inside the sclera is the choroid layer. This tissue is black because it absorbs extra light and prevents reflected light within the eye from blurring the image. The retina is found in front of the choroid layer. It is the light-sensitive part of the eye that contains the photoreceptor cells called the rods and cones. The lens functions to bend light to a focal point on the retina. The shape of the lens can be adjusted to produce a clear image of objects at different distances. 
the ciliary muscles and suspensory ligaments help with this function. The iris functions like a diaphragm to regulate the size of the pupil or light opening. There are two fluid-filled chambers, the aqueous humor and vitreous humor. These maintain the shape of the eyeball and have some refractive properties. So refraction is actually what helps us see. The lens that's in your eye, this lens here, is a convex lens. And it takes light rays from the world all around you and focuses them into a clear image on your retina. So this is an interesting activity you can do on your own, you can do it at home, or you can do it here at school. What you need to do is to get a small mirror and just look at your eye really closely in the mirror you'll be able to see your pupil, which is the black hole in the middle of your eye, your iris, which is the colored part of your eye, and the sclera, which is the white of your eye. This is the part of your eye that gets bloodshot when you have bloodshot eyes. What you want to do is look at your eye in the mirror when a bright light is shining near you. Then, shut that bright light off and observe how the iris and the pupil change you should see that the iris either contracts or dilates, that is, makes the pupil smaller or makes the pupil larger, to let more light in, or less light in, depending on what you need. If you think about the lenses that we used in the light box lab, we had a thin convex lens and a thick convex lens, and those two lenses had different focal lengths. As the lens in your eye changes from a thin lens to a thick lens, remember it is flexible, the focal length changes as well. And this is what helps you see objects at different distances. So those muscles in your eye are continually adjusting so that you can see clearly. You may notice that if you look at something in the far distance and relax your vision, that you can actually cause those muscles to relax and things can start looking blurry to you. Generally, you don't have to think about focusing. It's something that your brain takes care of automatically for you. If your eyes are not capable of focusing an image clearly on your retina, glasses or contacts can help with that. So, for example, if you are farsighted, which means you can see things that are far away quite clearly, but you can't see up close very well, they might give you a convex lens that looks like this. That'll change and shorten the focal length so that instead of an imaging wanting to focus behind your retina, like it does here, it'll focus right on your retina. If you are nearsighted, which means you can see close things that are close by just fine, but you can't see far away, what's happening is that the image is, is focusing in front of your retina. And so people who are nearsighted have glasses that are concave lenses. They're lenses that are thinner in the middle. Those extend the focal length so that the image focuses better on your retina. So here's a quick example to show you. This is a image of what light rays look like in the eye of a person who has good vision. That image is focused clearly on the retina and this is what the person would see. This is a person with myopia. Notice their lens is focusing the image in front of the retina and the world would look somewhat blurry to them. If you add in a concave lens in front of that, it does a little bit of pre-focusing of the light rays so that ultimately they focus correctly on the retina. This again restores their image to a clear one where the world isn't all fuzzy. Again, vision is about more than just your eyes. If you take a look through this paragraph and feel free to pause, you'll be amazed that you can read it very clearly even though the letters of the order have the order of the letters has been jumbled around significantly. Your brain is able to compensate for a lot of things that are strange in your field of vision. Some folks have different types of color blindness. This is because the cones in their retina are not able to sense certain colors as well. So if you look through these pictures here. You should, if you don't have any particular color blindness, be able to see numerals in all of these. In this first one, you can see the number 25. Here. In the second one, you can see the number 
29. In this one, you would see the number 45. And in this last one, the number 56. Now, if there are any of these where you can't see a numeral clearly there, that indicates that you have some type of color blindness. Statistically, about 10% of men are colorblind, so we would expect that there would be some colorblind students watching this program. The reason that we have two eyes is to help us have depth perception. So if you were to look at something far away, perhaps stick your thumb out in front of you and then line your thumb up with something far away. You might have to close one eye to do it. Now, keep your thumb exactly where it is, but switch which eye is open. You'll notice that it appears as though the image of your thumb moves back and forth when you do that. That's because the world looks slightly different to each of your two eyes, simply because they're spread apart. Your brain is able to take this information and create a 3D image from it. 3D movies use this property. What they do in 3D movies is they place slightly different lenses over your left eye and your right eye. And the movies are shot with two slightly different images. And so your left eye sees a particular image and your right eye sees a slightly different image. And your brain integrates those two into a 3D image.